to be better prepared on the international scene and not just on the national scene for response to these threats, there needs to be uh, preparedness. There needs to be investment before the threat actually plays out. That's the voice of Dr. Nahid Bedelia, board certified infectious diseases physician and the founding director of the Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases Policy and Research at Boston University. She's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button. Tom, it's tough to keep track of all the national security news these days. Leaders of the G7 met last week. NATO members are meeting this week. Israel has ousted its longest serving prime minister. And President Biden will meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin this week. Hey, Michelle. Indeed, there's a lot going on. The Biden-Putin summit this Wednesday in Geneva will be the first meeting between these two as president. Uh, And we will be watching it closely, particularly for clues about future arms control talks. And Michelle, what are you planning for early warning today? Well, first, we're previewing the upcoming Iranian elections this Friday and what we can likely expect from the vote. And then we discuss the Lavender Offense Victim Exoneration Act, the Love Act, and the need for a similar undertaking in the nuclear space. So stay with us. After that, Emma Belcher, president of Plowshares Fund, sits down with Nahid Bedelia, an infectious disease physician. Uh, Talking about the coronavirus pandemic, Bedelia explains how national security decisions must take the issues of health and human security into account. They also talk about how challenging it is to get people to pay attention to threats that feel remote but could be devastating, uh, like global pandemics and nuclear war. So please stay tuned for this crucial conversation that I think can broaden our perspectives on national security. Finally, we answer a question on the dismantlement of nuclear weapons on this week's Q&A segment. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, shoot us a DM at press button pod or send us an email at press the button at plowshares.org. And if you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Every little bit helps us to grow our show and our audience, and we really appreciate your feedback. But with that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Tal. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Asal Rod, Senior Research Fellow at the National Iranian American Council, and Luke Schlesner, co-founder and the president of Out in National Security. Thank you both for joining. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Happy to be here. As you know, we have seven minutes to cover the week's nuclear and national security news starting now. Asal, on June 18th, Iranians will be headed to the polls to select a successor to President Hassan Rouhani. Right now, the candidate expected to win is Chief Justice Ibrahim Raisi, given his support by the IRGC and Supreme Leader. What are you watching for? Uh, well, Raisi is certainly the candidate favorite to win. Uh, there's multiple reasons for that. One is uh, that he has held high posts already uh, in Iran in the last several decades, uh, for instance, as uh Chief Justice of the Judiciary. Um, He is rumored to be someone uh, that will potentially replace Supreme Leader Khamenei. So you can see that he he has a very significant place um, within the Islamic Republic. Uh, And in addition to that, it's because of the vetting process. Um, The vetting process of the Guardian Council has always been undemocratic, but this elections, disqualifications are sort of unprecedented to the point where, you know, commentators and Iranians themselves are saying it's more of an appointment uh, rather than an election. You had very significant figures within Iran, um, someone like Ali Ali Ladijani, who uh, was parliamentary speaker and, you know, himself and his family are staples within the Iranian state apparatus in post-revolutionary Iran, and yet even he was disqualified, which really gives Raisi the uh, advantage as being one of the best known and well-placed candidates to win this election. Uh, In addition to that, I mean, Raisi ran in 2017 against Rouhani. Now, 
Uh, Rouhani won that election and he did so strongly with about 8 million more votes, but there isn't really as much competition against Raisi. While there's a lot of commentary about the fact that there are Iranians who are planning to boycott the election, that there is very little enthusiasm. And if there is little turnout, that will actually benefit the conservatives as it has historically, um, and again, give Raisi an advantage. I would just, you know, mention that there's no guarantee. There are, there have been surprises in Iranian elections in the past. Uh, the 2005 election of Ahmadinejad is an example of that. Iranians have gotten more energized to vote sometimes just days before the election. And we're looking, we're about, you know, four days outside of the election right now. So uh, that being said, there isn't a lot of energy around it. There's a lot of people who are, you know, just frustrated by their situation, frustrated by the economy, um, coupled with sanctions is making their lives miserable within a pandemic, especially with this new disqualification process. Um, you can see why there is that kind of frustration. There is the moderate candidate, Abdel Nasser Hemati, who was uh, the governor of the Central Bank of Iran. He's making some traction in the debates. You know, he's more of a moderate. He's really the only moderate that was allowed to run. But again, you know, all of that being said, it does seem like there will be low voter turnout. And if that is the case, um, then that's a pretty easy victory for Raisi. Thanks, Asal. Luke, June, as we know, is LGBTQ Pride Month, honoring the June 1967 Stonewall Uprising in New York City. As a part of that, I want to talk about the history of the Lavender Scare, a period during the 1950s and 60s of particularly heightened discrimination when federal employees who were thought to be gay were fired. And since 2017, we've seen the introduction and reintroduction of the Lavender Offense Victim Exoneration Act, or the Love Act, to acknowledge the estimated thousand State Department employees harmed and ensure protections for our LGBTQIA diplomats today. Why do you see this act as particularly important? I see the act as particularly important in a couple of ways. Uh, first and foremost, the discrimination started in the 1940s and continued through the 1990s, which means that thousands and thousands of Americans and their friends and families were affected. Many of those people are still alive and their records need to be reviewed, updated and compensated. And those who are not also need to be honored appropriately. Second, uh, it's important to raise up the history of bureaucratic violence by the United States government against queer people, regardless of when and where. And that is much more for allies than for our community. It's important to, like other recent historical events, educate the wider American public about the government's behavior towards minorities. Uh, third, the bill offers a model for an independent commission going forward that would make recommendations regarding LGBTQIA uh, foreign service officers and civil servants so that we could recruit, retain, promote queer people, which is essential to our mission uh, as out in national security, but also is good for the uh, health and safety of the country going forward. And this would extend to things like recognizing same-sex marriages and making sure LGBTQIA State Department officials could go abroad with the same level of recognition as their heterosexual counterparts. Now, as you mentioned, in this case, we are only talking about the State Department. Do you see a need for similar efforts in the nuclear space? Absolutely. Um, there's a companion bill to the Love Act uh, for the Department of Defense, civilians and uniformed service members and veterans. And of course, the other part of the national security establishment in the 20th century was the national nuclear complex, which was vast and secretive. Uh, the challenge there is finding everyone. Uh, obviously, it was illegal to be gay and serve in the federal government. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover kept files on over 100,000 queer people. Those files were destroyed. Uh, on his death. So we actually don't know who is missing, aside from the people who've been willing to step forward and either sue the federal government, uh, which has happened in several cases, both the State Department and at the Department of Defense, uh, in my favorite Supreme Court case, which is high tech gays versus disco. And obviously, you know, we know that roughly one in five Americans is in some sense non heterosexual, which means for any large employer, you turn through a bunch of queer people. And that means in this particular case, from Project Manhattan all the way through the, the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission to the Department of Energy, they almost certainly ruined American lives and wasted American expertise. Uh, but because of the social stigma that comes with that, it is hard to find people who, given the generation they came from, don't want to be found. And given the way that those personnel records are classified, 
are hard to take a look at. Uh, so it would be good for the Department of Energy and related agencies to step up and work with their historians, open up their archives. Senator Granholm should go before Congress during Pride and offer a preliminary assessment of the situation, whether or not that's this year or next. I know our seven minutes are up, but before we go, congratulations on your recently released National Security and Foreign Policy LGBTQIA 2021 Out Leaders List and New Voices List. Asal, congrats on being named one of those leaders. Where can listeners go to learn more about the work of Out in National Security? Thank you. It was very much an honor to be selected among such uh, accomplished people. So thank you for that. And you're very accomplished yourself. And it's wonderful for us to be able to include you and uh, share your story with others. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. They can follow us on Twitter at Out in NatSec. And they can pop onto our homepage, which is out in nationalsecurity.org. And we have a little info box there where you can ask questions and you can sign up for our listserv. Um, we have lots of events and activities for Pride and throughout the year. And you know, we always are thrilled to encounter more people across more areas of expertise. Thank you both for coming on. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Warner and I'm the managing director of Plowshares Fund. Even though I've been working in the nuclear field for nearly nine years, there is still so much to learn. That's why I'm a dedicated listener of Press the Button. I so appreciate each episode where I can get the top stories of the week and a deeper dive into critical conversations with thought leaders and experts in nuclear policy and national security. I'm also a proud supporter of Plowshares Fund. Did you know that many of the guests featured on Press the Button are supported by Plowshares? Since our founding 40 years ago, all of our work is made possible by individuals just like you. Curious, committed, passionate. If you like what you're hearing on Press the Button and want to support the work of Plowshares Fund, please donate today. Whether it's $5, $50, $500, Your generosity helps create a safer future free from the threat of nuclear weapons. Visit plowshares.org today to make a donation or join me and make it monthly. Whatever you do, stay informed, stay safe, and stay connected. Together, we can create a world where nuclear weapons can never be used again. Thank you for listening. We're at a very exciting time here at Plowshares as we widen our perspective and think about how we might broaden the concept of national security and change how we prioritise what truly keeps us safe. If there's one takeaway from the global pandemic, it's that we can't ignore the fact that our security, our livelihood is tied to everyone else's. We had Dr. Nahid Bedalia on as a guest at our policy forum last November, where she provided a terrific perspective on all of these issues. So we've invited her back for a more in-depth discussion on the intersection of health and national security. Dr. Bedalia is a board-certified infectious disease physician and founding director of the new Centre for Emerging Infectious Diseases Policy and Research. She's also the Associate Director of the National Emerging Infectious Disease Laboratories at Boston University and an Associate Professor in the Section of Infectious Diseases at the U School of Medicine. And I'm particularly excited to talk to her today as I've been lucky to see her develop as a leader and change maker in the health and security field, starting from our time in graduate school at the Fletcher School at Tufts University to now. Welcome to Heed. Thanks for having me, Anna. What a small world and how quickly time passes. Yes to all of those. (laughs) So um, here at Plowshares, we know very well there's a connection between security and health. Nuclear weapons in particular have detrimental health effects that last decades and affect generations, and they particularly impact marginalised communities. So from your perspective, how do you see the intersection of health and national security overlapping? Um, uh, It's not something that's new, right? I think even um, dating back to the HIV pandemic in 90s and 2000s, there was a lot of conversation about how broad spread as well as fast moving infectious diseases threats pose a national security uh, threat, partly because they are uh, destabilizing. They, they, you know, as we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, and, and many may say, you know, despite 
how tremendously uh, devastating this pandemic has been, it could have been even worse because the mortality could have been higher because the transmissibility could have been uh, worse. And, and the concern is that when these pandemics happen, they completely devastate communities, uh, the, the economic impact that they have, and they put a strain on supply, you know, food supplies, uh, medication supplies. And, and so all of those things tie to not just the individual's health, but the community's health, as well as the nation's ability to function uh, at the economic level and to prosper. And, and beyond that, you know, as you very rightly mentioned, it's very similar to what uh, nuclear weapons do. My experience as a, you know, part of what I've done over the last um, decade is, is I responded to emerging infectious diseases outbreaks. And I can tell you with certainty that, you know, outbreaks tend to take advantage of the cracks that already exist in our communities. They prey on those that we leave out in the cold. They take advantage of, of communities that are marginalized who don't have access to the same resources. And then the COVID-19 pandemic very clearly illustrates that as well. Yeah, there are very interesting connections there. And when we talk about how the US is sort of responding and the US's commitment to health, it's interesting to look at how this is prioritised and what's reflected in the budget. And we see that the Biden administration has released the budget last month and indicates we should expect around a 23% increase in spending for health and human services uh, with around $8.7 billion for the Centers for Disease Control. So what does this tell us about Biden's commitment to health and how do we convince policymakers that national security decisions really must take into consideration issues of health and human security? Yeah, well, I mean, one thing to step back even before we get to the domestic budget, one other thing that I thought of as we were talking is when there is a global pandemic, what we've seen during this pandemic was that pandemics become a yet another stage on which geopolitics plays out. And, you know, whether it's uh, countries using vaccine diplomacy or countries competing on raw resources for raw materials, for medications. And so all of those aspects point to the fact that to be better prepared on the international scene and not just on the national scene for response to these threats, there needs to be uh, preparedness. There needs to be investment before the threat actually plays out. And as I'm heartened to see sort of the increase um, to, to CDC, the thing that's really hurt the U.S. is that over the last decade, we've seen gutting of the public health infrastructure at the state level. In particular, I think you see southern and southeastern states actually gutting many of their public health infrastructure and funding. And even before the COVID pandemic, what you saw were, for example, decreases in things like vector control programs around mosquitoes and other aspects, which are um, so fewer people working on public health issues meant that when the pandemic hit, those states were even uh, less resilient to be able to get education out there about the pandemic in a fast moving emergency. And so the CDC aspects and the funding in the national budget, I think is important because CDC itself over the last administration did see decreases in funding. Um, there was an initial increase in things like global health security after the West African Ebola virus disease epidemic. And um, there wasn't as much interest under the Trump administration. And, and what you saw was, you know, actually rolling in of, of many of the global security efforts under the, the larger infrastructure rather than the dedicated funding stream and, and more work on that. And, and so the increase now under, under the Biden administration on the federal level for CDC is important, but what that kind of doesn't cover is, is that difference between states because that's going to leave many of our states vulnerable and that requires engagement at the state level because interestingly, the United States public health is, you know, is, is in the public sector and the healthcare system is in the private sector and, and the public health system is very much fractured between the federal and the state. That's certainly a really fascinating additional angle on all of this. So, Nahid, um, can you tell us how public policy at both the national and state level play a role in all of this? A lot of times domestic politics actually plays a big role in how the country portrays itself or is able to manage global health security threats. Just to build off of this question of how domestic policy 
governance and domestic politics plays a role in, in global health security, you look no further than, than what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic here in the United States, but also in places like Brazil and in, in, in India, where you saw governments, you know, who were undergoing a election, particularly in India and in, in the U.S., and sort of the focus of, of how the pandemic was responded to and how it played into domestic politics around the two parties and how information was shared with the public, how information was somehow colored you know, by the Trump administration and, and to downplay the pandemic. A similar thing was done in India. You know, it, it really shows that it's not just preparedness, but it, it's also political engagement and good domestic governance that's required if we're going to be more resilient to these threats. That's fascinating. And I, I'd been meaning to ask you about, you know, what the experience suggests for the future of global cooperation to solve problems. But what's fascinating here is how you see that it's not just that kind of interaction at the highest between countries level, but that what's going on domestically really plays a part in probably the ability of governments um, at their sort of federal level or, or what have you to um, cooperate with other countries. What's your take on that as you think about how domestic policy influences foreign policy? We all know it's very complicated. Um, what do you see in terms of the future for global cooperation on not just future pandemics, but other big problems of the day? Yeah, um, you know, there's so I'm going to step back and take a more technical perspective on that. So there are actually good lessons coming out of this pandemic about things that we can probably build on moving forward. One is the global collaboration on efforts like COVAX, which is a multilateral agency that you know put together with CEPI and, and Gavi and, and WHO to try to you know tackle what was seen in H1N1 pandemic, which was that low and middle income countries did not see the vaccines that were produced in, in, in high income countries for a really long time. And and, and, and it's not perfect, right? COVAX has uh, not been able to compete on the on the open market with high income countries and trying to get enough vaccines to get out to low and middle income countries. But the idea that such a multilateral um, effort can exist and that you know it can leverage provision of vaccines to high income countries with a eye towards equity to try to get about twenty percent of the population in, in lower income countries uh, with access to the vaccines that they would not have seen otherwise for a long period of time. Um, it's not perfect. I mean, the other reasons that it's not perfect is we've seen that COVAX was not funded well enough, you know, but it creates a platform on future cooperation. The kind of work that came out of Ebola virus disease epidemic in West Africa and the subsequent work in the Democratic Republic of Congo's outbreaks that we saw over the last couple of years helped build organizations like CEPI which is meant to sort of drive the science forward, take the risk away to try to support science that can give us the candidates for vaccines and medical countermeasures uh, for likely viruses that have epidemic potential. It also created greater uh, collaboration, uh, you know, for organizations that are looking to sort of create a greater sort of scientific collaboration like just say that that shares sequences, scientific sequences of viruses that seem threatening. But there's a long way to go. And the three things that I think that kind of threw me off, you know, one I mentioned already, which is how strongly domestic politics can have an influence on, on pandemic response globally. Two is how unprepared we are from a supply chain's perspective. You know, how if a fire is in one place, if an epidemic is in West Africa, you know, you can you can have a safety net sort of fall into place and, and bring in supplies for personal protective equipment and, and treatments and, and healthcare workers from, from elsewhere to help. But if the fire is everywhere, like this pandemic was, we are not prepared um, to be able to produce enough medical equipment. Um, and I'm hoping, and medical treatments and you know, me essential medicines. Um, and we, I'm hoping one of the things that comes out of this, this epidemic is, is strengthening global manufacturing and as well as regional you know, strengthening to make sure that when something like this happens, that what doesn't happen is that high income countries buy up all the supplies and, and what happens instead is then, what happens you know, unfortunately in that setting is that you see low income countries left without personal protective equipment, which is what I saw, you know, many of my colleagues in Uganda, for example, it had no N95s to deal with tuberculosis, a disease that's endemic there, because they were all bought up during this pandemic. And so that supply chains is number two. And then the third thing that took me by surprise is the advent of the age of misinformation and disinformation. 
um, how this is only the beginning, how big a role disinformation and misinformation played during this last pandemic. And I don't think anybody that I know has a workable solution, you know, and, and how to, in a fast moving scientific crisis, how do you keep the forces of disinformation at bay that hope to sow confusion, that hope to sow division, that hope to sort of, you know, set the response behind, you know, or set, hope to set the response sort of backwards in, in terms of addressing these types of infections? I don't, I don't know. I don't think we, I think that's a challenge that we still need to work on for the next one. Thanks so much. And I think it's fascinating when we look at some of these factors and how they are probably commonly held by a number of challenges that we have uh, globally today and domestically. And the role of misinformation is certainly a really big one and how to tackle that. Um, is something that's challenging, I imagine, sort of beyond um, the infectious disease uh, field into into a number of others. Um, So taking a little bit of that kind of step back and thinking about challenges in general, I remember talking with you a couple of years back about the possibility of a global pandemic. You sort of brought it up. I remember we were having a conversation with a few of our friends and I found myself doing what I know a lot of people do when they think about the possibility of nuclear war, sort of shuddering at the potential, but being glad someone else is working on it and moving on to thinking about more pleasant things. And certainly at the time, I remember thinking, oh, I'm so glad Nahid's on it. Um, (laughs) But it must be frustrating for you now to see us in this position and the lack of preparedness there has been for something that many people like you and others were warning for a while was a distinct possibility. So what do you think we can do to get people to pay attention to threats like this that they might feel a remote yet really could be devastating? Well, the interesting thing is whether it's nuclear wars, pandemics, right, this existential crisis, they all suffer from the same uh, issue, which is that as the report from the National Academy of Medicine on neglected dimensions of global security said, we tend to cycle between cycles of panic and neglect. When there's a threat on the horizon, everybody pays attention, there's political capital put into this, there's actual capital put into this, and then when the threat's gone, you know, there's just neglect. And and that's happened, you know, the last few times I've been, whether it's H1N1 or, or the Ebola, you know, epidemic, all the ones that I've been involved in have seen initial sort of um, will say, you know, initial investments saying, well, this time is going to be different. And, and then a couple of years pass and funding dries up and the attention turns elsewhere and the political cycle changes and the games are lost because, you know, if you can't keep the training up, if you can't keep paying the healthcare workers, if you cannot keep the laboratory stocked up, if you cannot keep your surveillance system stocked up, then you are once again creating the same environment that led to uh, the emergence of those pathogens in the first place. So there are a couple of things to it. I, I do hope that the scale of this pandemic will mean that both the political and the actual capital put on the topics that we're talking about will be more sustained, but I'm going to maintain a a healthy dose of cynicism (laughs) because we have great capacity to to force normalcy back onto uh, what should be, you know, pressing existential crisis. Climate change is another one, right? It's we, we want to ignore it to try to go back to normal. One thing is that we need to invest in a lot of the things that you've heard a lot of people talk about. They talked about supply chains, you know, others have talked about the importance of surveillance systems to ensure that we pick up these diseases early before they go from outbreaks into epidemics and from epidemics into pandemics. And there are a few steps to that. One is the work that needs to be done to help track these diseases before they jump into humans from animals. We know that uh, two thirds of the new infections that we're seeing, you know, emerge are zoonoses. They're jumping from animals into humans and it's happening. And then this is where, how it's all tied in. It's, it's, it's happening because we're changing the world around us. You know, there's twice as many of us on the face of the earth as there were when I was born. And we are changing the landscape, taking over wetlands, uh, putting down roads into forests. We are uh, raising more animals. We are eating more animals because there are more of us. And, and that's leading to environment where domestic animals and wild animals are in closer proximity and humans are in closer proximity with animals. And, and that's allowing viruses to make the jump that they were not able to make before. So a few efforts like the Global Virome Project and, and PREDICT is another one that are working on tracking those infections. The part where my work comes in is actually when you see new disease or new infection jump from animals into humans, 
most parts of the world, we miss that because at the terminal end of all surveillance for infectious diseases are myriads of communities that don't have access to care. And if they can't get access to care, a cluster of infectious diseases will grow larger until you know, it becomes something we can't control. And the truth is, if you look at the numbers in many parts of the world, when people come in with like fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, they're just treated empirically for malaria, right? And they're sent home. There's no laboratory capacity to confirm whether it's something that's a new infection. And so you're seeing that lack of health equity and that last mile is actually one of our biggest weaknesses. And, and so, yes, we got to work on all the high tech things. And yes, we got to work on supply chains. And yes, we got to work on all those aspects. But what we also need to work on is health equity, um, because that's protecting people from disease, people from infectious diseases at baseline, from endemic infectious diseases, also helps us tackle the emergence of new infections. And, and that's something that I unfortunately think we're going to go through a few more times before we learn the lesson that that's what's needed. You're now the founding director of a new centre at Boston University School of Medicine, the Centre for Emerging Infectious Diseases Policy and Research. Uh, congratulations on this. And Tell us what inspired you to start the center. Thanks so much, Emma. So I, you know, a lot of this is work that I've just been doing. And now the center is serving as a catalyst to bring in others who are doing similar work under the same roof, if you will. You know, um, part of what we saw in, in this pandemic and, and what I've seen in, in my prior work is that when these types of emergencies arise, the questions aren't just medical. They aren't just scientific. They're often economic, they're ethical, they're social, they're cultural, they are, they are technological that's you know, beyond just the medical. And, and so the goal of SEED, which is the Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases Policy and Research, is, is to do transdisciplinary research. And some of the things that we're fo focusing on, for example, range from um, best practices for public health education during outbreaks, right? Like learning from communities about what type of uh, outreach and education works best. What are the principles that we need to get out to not just pass mandates, but actually to, to get people the tools, educational tools that they need, all the way to state-sponsored disinformation during outbreaks, all the way to, you know, new novel diagnostic uh, technologies and how they can be deployed for emerging infectious diseases to how global governance, you know, and, and, and what have we learned from this pandemic and, and how can we more quickly uh, use science diplomacy to cross those sort of barriers, your political barriers. And then more personally, you know, for myself and others who are working is, is how... Um, how we bridge health inequities beforehand so that we we make ourselves more resilient since we know that it's usually, you know, it's usually those that we leave out in the cold that, that suffer the most during these pandemics. How do we uh, make sure that we strengthen, you know, our capacity everywhere by bridging those health and inequities beforehand that relate to vulnerabilities that come from these types of threats? So we're doing transdisciplinary research. We're doing um, local and global capacity strengthening. So work in East and West Africa, elsewhere in the world, as well as training. And that training and education is, is not just for students and academics, but we're, we're placing a huge effort to, to engage with our communities around us and communities across the world, as well as legislators. Um, some of the things that we're doing, for example, are providing legislative briefs to people who are making the policies around us. You know, wouldn't it be great if we could get just in time scientific knowledge and its policy implications um, to our local politicians, to our state politicians, so they can make more educated decisions and policies? Fantastic. It sounds as though this approach is really very holistic and certainly makes a lot of sense. Where can our listeners learn more about the centre and this really important work that you're launching? You can find us at www.bu.edu slash CEID, Center for Emerging Infectious Diseases, CEID. Um, and you can find us on Twitter at B-U-C-E-I-D, B-U-C-E-D. Fantastic. Dr. Badalia, Nahid. This has been a fascinating conversation. Thrilled to have had you on. Uh, thank you for all of the work that you're doing and looking at this global pandemic in multiple ways and from multiple levels and pulling all these different aspects together. We really appreciate the public service that you've done and your leadership in this area. So thank you and all the best um, for your future work at the centre. Thank you for having me and thank you for the work you do.
And now for everyone's favorite nuclear Q&A. Are you ready, Michelle? I am ready, Tom. This week's question comes from Jake from Richmond. Jake asks, once nuclear weapons are created, is there a way to safely and totally dismantle them? Oh, excellent question, Jake. The answer is yes, there is a way to safely and totally dismantle them. The questions are largely political. So just in terms of the big picture, you know, in the world, they're at the peak in the 1980s, there were over 70,000 nuclear weapons. We are now down to just over 13,000 today. And those excess weapons have been either retired or dismantled. So from a, the technical side, we actually do have the experience taking these weapons apart. Um, it's largely an engineering problem. In this case, you have to take apart both warheads heads and delivery systems. The process is dangerous. The materials are very toxic, flammable, radioactive in some cases. And so it ends up being really slow. And there is a backlog in both the United States and Russia estimated to be in the thousands of warheads that are awaiting this dismantlement process. If you're interested in the technical side of it, Outrider Foundation has a really great video that I recommend you go check out. Um, and the reality is, you know, it's not just in the U.S. and Russia that this has been done, although I do want to point out the megatons to megawatts program, um, which in the 90s and 2000s, you actually saw 500 metric tons of bomb grade, highly enriched uranium left over from Russian weapons that was recycled. Um, and sold to the U.S. to be used in American nuclear power plants. It's estimated that as many as one in 10 light bulbs were powered by these old Russian bombs. And so not only can you take them apart safely, you can also feed them back into the process of really why we want to have nuclear technology for things that bring peaceful benefits to the world. You also have the case of South Africa, which in 1990 began the process of dismantling the six bombs and the partial seventh bomb that it had before it announced that it had taken these bombs apart in 1993. But this gets to what I said before about how the real question is political. So they took these apart they then went to the world and said, we've dismantled them. And it was up to the world to figure out, had they actually done so? And this leads to the three elements of dismantlement, which I think are going to be kind of the big remaining questions. Is it transparent? Is it verifiable? And is it irreversible? That's where it really gets to this question. You know, is there a way that you can show the world it's transparent that you've taken the bombs apart? Is it verifiable that engineers can say you didn't hide specific pieces? You don't have a bomb in the basement. And is it irreversible, which is, you know where the sites are, where these uh, items are produced. You know what goes into it so that, um, you know, if a country were to decide to restart a program, you would know that that was the case. And so I think that is where we will be needing to focus our energies in terms of the types of technologies or political arrangements that would make it happen. But in terms of the technical side of it, yes, the answer is we do. Another week, another question. Thanks, Jake, for the question. And remember, if you want your question answered on the air, shoot us a DM at press button pod or send an email at press the button at plowshares.org. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited by Derek Sender, Will Lowry, and Delphine Vigil, with research and assistance from Doreen Horshig and Harry Tarpy. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering by Derek Sender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org. <laughs>